I am thrilled and honored to be sitting this morning with Forrest Moretti. Uh, thanks for having me. A lot of disease, as we now describe it, was in fact man-made. The moth in the iron lung about poliomyelitis. Polio is sort of, as I've described it, the foundational myth or tale, depending on whether you believe it or not, that undergirds nearly all of modern scientific recognition. The fact that the earliest outbreak of polio included so many different types of animals among its victims made me question immediately. It fits with what uh, I believe Isaac Asimov said, that the most important phrase in science is not aha, it's that's funny. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. And I've never heard that. Comes from a small number of stories. One of them is polio. One of them is the Spanish flu. And then there's the question of SARS, MERS, and Zika. If those stories aren't what we think they are, everything about that picture changes. When we say polio today, when you or I mention that word, we instinctively think of paralysis caused by the polio virus. Unfortunately, they focused on a single virus as the cause, even when they knew there were multiple viruses, bacteria, and, and other environmental factors that could cause nearly the same thing. I started going through what was the most prevalent medical journal at the time, which is the Boston Medical Journal. So uh, in my research, I discovered that there was an outbreak the year earlier, something that I had never seen covered before. It was a tiny article uh, in the same region of the country. It was just outside of Boston. Oh, that's really funny. That made me start thinking, wait a minute, something's going on here, uh, perhaps regionally at, at this time, that may have had some impact on what they were calling, calling the first epidemic of polio. So with the DDT story hanging over my head, which at the time I thought was pure folly, I, I laughed at people who said that DDT had something to do with polio. Environmental agent that was introduced into that area at the time that perhaps had some effect. I, I just couldn't believe no one had ever stumbled across this story. In New England, at that very time, there was an invasive species of moth that had been begun destroying nearly every flora and fauna uh, across the region. It was called the gypsy moth. A Frenchman who had moved to the United States uh, in hopes of a better life had begun to cultivate uh, more hardy caterpillars because uh, the silk producing caterpillars were prone to disease, the domesticated ones that all silk is created from. And so the danger of invasive species was poorly understood. The, the law of unintended consequences has, has yet to lose a single battle, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, I, I worry about that with antibiotics. I, I'm very concerned that antibiotics um, are, will one day, we will have been proven to have been wrong to ever use them in the first place. Vaccines, antibiotics, and surgery. We are also, and have been, very skeptical of the way antibiotics are used. I know that scientific studies often are rigged ahead of time in that if you want to maximize the effect, you use mice. If you want to minimize the effect, you use primates. Obviously, we are behaving very stupidly with antibiotics, right? We're using, we're giving them to animals that aren't sick in order to slightly increase the rate at which they uh, put on mass uh, prior to slaughter. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. In the same way I question antibiotics, I certainly question vaccines. The initial realization that the gypsy moth uh, had been released by this Frenchman um, didn't concern him greatly. Um, he left the house that he was living in, and within a few years, throngs uh, of these creatures started to appear. I understand the prickly nature of their, their backs. Their, the birds, the local birds, weren't uh, properly designed or evolved to, to consume them, so they, they thrived and they, they grew to millions and millions and millions and began to decimate the northeastern countryside. The only pesticide they had available to them to use at the time was something called Paris Green, which was, uh, strangely enough, actually a dye used to color wallpaper and children's toys. <laughs> uh, but it was also known to kill animals, uh, such was its toxicity, and they used it and it didn't work. It just essentially had no effect. So a, a, a giant search was launched, a new pesticide, uh, which they called lead arsenic. The two of them, uh, when mixed properly, it was extremely viscous and it wouldn't wash off. Because the gypsy moth was so prevalent and was decimating the countryside, there were massive campaigns to to essentially coat every living surface with this pesticide. They didn't realize its toxicity. The summer after the pesticide was invented was the summer that first uh, gi giant outbreak of poliomyelitis was discovered in Boston. You can trace its spread by tracing the migration of the gypsy moth. Arsenic was essentially, unfortunately, a popular medicinal treatment at the time. Metals were thought to have 
essentially far greater positive effects on human anatomy than negative. As common as you might give a, 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 a teething child Tylenol today. Because yeah. Tylenol isn't safe either. The dentists who prescribed mercury amalgams for cavities uh, evidently didn't understand that cavities uh, can fix themselves. Your body can heal itself. We've been taught that all infection is bad, all disease is bad, all suffering is bad. Imagine if I were to tell you that your child ne needn't ever exercise because we have an injection of steroids that will build their muscles for them. <laughs> your child needn't ever get an infection. They'll be better off just getting a slew of vaccines their whole childhood. That's perfectly fine and acceptable. So the inoculation of smallpox, which again, I, I will stress, it was not really a vaccine at all. You were simply giving people the smallpox. Healthy people can suffer through this infection with very few ill effects. They thought there was a cowpox virus, vaccinia as they called it that if they could just keep it alive like a sourdough starter, they could, you know, just scratch the skin of people and, and hey, they would get a very mild infection compared to smallpox. Now, the reality is it was probably the same thing. So they, wait, they didn't you, know the difference. Jenner, having noted the immunity of milkmaids. Oh, it's lore. It's absolute lore. Yeah, well, no, no, look, He it's was lore. a I... fraud. He was a scientific fraud who paid for his PhD or doctors at a fake university. He was laughed at by all his peers. And, and early on, the earliest polio outbreaks were all rural because in my opinion this is where pesticides were being used most aggressively but there was something to the fact that there was a viral component at work here polio as they called it back then was the full name of polio at that time was acute polio acute poliomyelitis of the anterior horn and the anterior horn if, if you're looking down on your spinal column the anterior is the front half of your spinal cord that's the part of the, the where the neurons that run through their controlled movement Neurons on the backside of your spinal cord control taste and, and sensitivity. And polio, for whatever reason, would only cause paralysis. It didn't affect your, your sense of uh, touch. It didn't cause pain, which is what lesions on the back of your spinal cord could do. The idea that the virus is so specific that it infects the front part of your spine, but it doesn't care if you're a chicken or a person. A polio infection, for those of you who don't know, it's an enteroviral infection. It's a virus that thrives in your gut, causes you to have diarrhea, all kinds of other problems, anything, you know, associated with gut, poor gut health. The disease was often called infantile paralysis, just so you know. Why infantile paralysis? Well, because it struck children, it struck babies, infants. Um, it was very, very rare for a true enteroviral polio infection to even infect an adult, most likely because they already had immunity to it. Immunity, by the way, gained without any sort of paralysis and without any knowledge of themselves even having the infection themselves. But something happened around that time in, the, in human history where suddenly these enteroviral infections appeared capable of paralyzing people, which is very, very odd that that would start happening, and particularly children. Now, one of the odd things, if I, another one more that's funny, is the infection, the paralysis almost always started in their legs. This was the hallmark understanding of polio. You remember, we start very generic and say people have lesions in their spinal cord and they're kind of paralyzed. And then we start getting more specific in that it's children, it's infants. And hey, it's only the front of their spinal cord. It's not the back. They don't have sensitivity and pain, which are commonly associated with poisoning, with metallic poisoning or pesticide poisoning. They get paralysis in the front side of their spinal cord where the intestines rest directly against uh, the bottom of the spinal cord the paralysis starts in the bottom of the spinal cord, the, the part of the nervous system that rests directly against the intestines, a geographical proximity that just feels too significant to overlook. And as soon as a virus hits the neuronal tissue, it, it doesn't move backwards, it moves up because again, it's a highway that, that these enteroviruses, uh, certain enteroviruses propagate along and it would start going up the spinal cord. And so you might start with a, a limp, limpness in the legs and then it might move itself up and your spine might start having problems and then eventually it would paralyze the muscles that allow you to expand your diaphragm and, and fill your lungs with air and that's essentially that was the real danger with polio in terms of death in that it could prevent you from inhaling and exhaling the virus could make the hop that as you described very easily when your intestines those things teeming with millions of enterovirus viruses rests directly against the spinal cord itself they certainly caused rampant problems during the DDT era, which is polio as we know it from the 1940s to the mid 1950s. The Salk vaccine was essentially the first uh, approved treatment for polio infections, and it differed uh, in that it was injected. The real difference between the Salk vaccine, which was first introduced in 1954, pulled from the shelves in 1955 due to a manufacturing problem that killed a few people, it did not work. It flat out didn't work. Now, 
maybe it, the reason why is it didn't address the problem of the enteroviral infection. It, if it worked and granted you immunity in your bloodstream, that was fine. A stratification between the mucosal immunity and your normal immunity are such that you can't fight off an enteroviral infection by developing immunity in your bloodstream. It's just not going to work. You have to do it in the gut. And shortly after World War I, they realized that planes, these things they had never used before outside of, I suppose, uh, shooting at each other, they realized they could crop dust with them. That was a new commercial application they had never used before. So uh, the spread of lead arsenic as a pesticide exploded. You see another rise, another blip in polio shortly after World War II when DDT began to be used. And a lot of people think that the vaccine vanquished polio uh, because, again, the Salk vaccine, which I would argue doesn't work, and, and many other scientists would, came online in 1954, uh, 55. The Sabin vaccine, which actually works despite its you know problems, it works, came online in 1961 for one strain of polio. There's three strains of polio, for those who don't know. Uh, 1963 was when the actual Sabin vaccine with three that addressed all three types of polio came online. Polio as an epidemic had been long gone before then. It, it essentially peaked in 1952 and started to die off well before even the Salk vaccine was being used widely. As I mentioned earlier, the Salk vaccine was introduced in 1955 to the nation. There were manufacturing defects, which caused it to not be properly um, killed. The virus to not be properly killed. And so it um, caused a bunch of polio. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it's unfortunately, it was a horrible story. Uh, I, I think um, there are people who suggest that polio is purely a, a pesticide caused problem. And if there's anything that would disprove them wrong, it's the fact that um, an improperly manufactured vaccine, which I will tell you did not have DDT in it, uh, caused, you know, 10 or 11 people to die from polio infection because it had the virus in the vaccine. Um, the vaccine was unnecessary. And the, even the Sabin vaccine, which does work against the polio virus itself, uh, was in the whole scheme of things, wasn't the hero we thought it was. It, it was the fact that mothers and fathers eventually realized DDT was far more toxic than they initially believed. And they complained enough that DDT uh, began uh, to, you know, to come to an end. You can start going through and it's 46, 47, contains DDT, contains DDT, 1952, no DDT, 1953, no DDT contained in this product. So you can just try, track the rise and fall of the popularity of the pesticide just through Life Magazine articles. But I started to think, well, why was a measles vaccine invented? No one was dying of it in the United States. It wasn't a rampant, terrible disease. Why did they do it? Well, it was because they could. Then realized herd immunity uh, was a falsity in, in the case of several vaccines, and, and I'm beginning to wonder uh, if it's completely false for all vaccines. Most, you will know this certainly with all the COVID and uh, vaccine research you've done, the, the, the notion of herd immunity is, is false for the COVID vaccine. It doesn't prevent its spread. Several other vaccines are certainly incapable of preventing its spread. And some of them, in fact, encourage its spread, such as the oral polio vaccine that Bill Gates administers in mass all across countries throughout the world. So I am now at the point, I apologize, I believe Vaccines are completely unnecessary, even in the third world. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard Bobby Kennedy mention the Dr. Peter A.B. study in Africa, where they followed a, a large co cohort of children who had gotten the um, DTaP vaccine and those who hadn't, and the mortality rate of those who had gotten the vaccine was 10 times higher. I am so opposed to vaccination. I, if I had the power, would ban all of them. I would outlaw every single one. I don't think any of them are worth it. I think the costs, the risks, from neurological illness, from autoimmunity, from even allergy itself, all three things that never existed before the widespread advent of mass vaccination. I think the damage they have caused is so severe that one day they will be completely banned from humanity. I did not know what an adjuvant was until beginning to dig into this, and I am now spooked at anything that depends on that mechanism to induce the immune system to overreact to an otherwise weak antigen. Um, that's not a reasonable thing to do. And if you were going to do it, it should come with some sort of a warning about what other things you might want to avoid while your immune system was in this hyperactive state. Longevity of the adjuvants in one's system, the quantity of mercury injected into you versus that same quantity ingested has a radically different implication for where that mercury ends up. The reason uh, why I believe aluminum adjuvant in vaccines is probably one of the most heinous crimes against humanity. And every time you do something, even things that you don't think should make a difference, like, you know, uh, glazed windows, Forrest Moretti, and I know I've pronounced it correctly. Yeah, you um, did. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining me. And uh, to everybody else, thanks for listening.